Thank you. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the president of AIOS, Professor Padna, for inviting me as her guest. <coughs> it's great to be here in India. The title of my talk is Corneal Ectasia Following Corneal Refractive Surgery uh, Perspective. My co-authors are Perry Binder and Mitchell Jackson. <coughs> These are my financial um, disclosures. During this 10-minute uh, journey, we can uh, review the various types of corneal ectasia, look at what causes corneal ectasia, look at the structure, structure, look at the histopathology following PRK and LASIK of those corneas that had progressed to corneal ectasia. Also then defocus a little bit and look at what effects there is on the cornea following various corneal procedures. <coughs> then look at the zonal view of the cornea, how do we manage corneal ectasia, and lastly, prevention of ectasia. Corneal ectasia, as we all know, can be either diffuse, involving the entire cornea, where the cornea becomes thin and ectatic, as in keratoglobus, or it can be more focal, which can be either due to iatrogenic causes or non-iatrogenic causes as listed uh, in the slide. And our focus will be on the iatrogenic refractive uh, procedures causing um, ectasia. So what causes ectasia? In 2013, we really don't know, we don't fully understand the mechanism of ectasia, what exactly causes ectasia. When we look at the literature, there are several perplexing case reports. When LASIK is performed in both eyes without known risk, one eye develops ectasia. Why is that? LASIK in one eye, both eyes develop ectasia. Obviously, these may be from first keratoconus. Ectasia after radial keratotomy has been well established. Ectasia after hyperopic ALK. Ectasia after PRK has been reported. Ectasia after increased IOP has been reversed with topical glaucoma medications. Ectasia has resulted following partial flaps. And of course, we all know there's no ectasia following DALK and no ectasia or delayed if interlaced flap is not lifted. Having looked at the types of ectasia and the etiology, let's look at the corneal structure. The most important part of the cornea in this talk, in this perspective, is the anteriormost part. The rigidity of the anteriormost part of the cornea, 100 to 120 microns, plays a very important role in the maintenance of the corneal curvature. I think that sentence needs to be repeated. Rigidity of the anteriormost part of the cornea plays a significant role in the maintenance of the corneal curvature. And in this zone, the two players of refractive surgery, namely PRK and LASIK, alters the zone and therefore possibly makes the cornea biomechanically weak. In this schematic representation, the cohesive tensile strength of the normal cornea, as you can see, is significantly contributed by the anterior part of the cornea. The posterior regions of the cornea plays a less significant role. Let's now look at some of the histopathological changes. In this report, they looked at 12 LASIK corneas and 1 PRK corneas. Both tissues showed interlamellar and interfibrillar biomechanical slippage following these refractive procedures. When you look at these tissues under light microscopy, it showed Bauman's layer breaks, epithelial hyperplasia with occasional hyperplasia, and thinned residual stromal bed. PRK showed similar changes in addition to stromal scar. When you look at these tissues under higher magnification, such as under transmission electron microscopy, there was thinning of collagen lamellae, loss of lamellar numbers in the residual stromal bed in post lasik ectasia and post PRK ectasia. For some reason, my uh, computer has a mind of its own. The slide keeps moving forwards, and it's a struggle. We're going back and forth. Okay. Let's, at this point, defocus a little bit. 
move away from refractive surgery just for a few minutes and look at a wider angle. Let's look at a wide angle view of corneal ectasia following various corneal procedures. <laughs> we know that DLEK was a complicated procedure. There it goes again. And we are, for the most part, part, marked, uh, part at uh, DSEC. I exclusively do DMEC at the present time for various reasons. And of course, PKP has been our gold standard in the past, which is changing rapidly. Penetrating keratoplasty, as we all know, is a full thickness tissue replacement. A circular wound is created, and when you look at the astigmatism, there's increase in the astigmatism, especially in those corneas which underwent full thickness grafting for keratoconus. And when you look at those corneal transplants where there was corneal ectasia, 80% of ectasia occurred at the graft host junction in these corneas. When you look at corneas with DELAC, which stands for deep lamellar endothelial keratoplasty, where a significant portion of the posterior corneal stroma is removed and replaced, there is no corneal ectasia. When you look at either DMEC or DSEC, where we only remove about 15 microns of the patient's cornea, there is no ectasia. That is a intraoperative composite photographs are showing the removal of Desmet's membrane as a single disc. So both in DSEC and DMEC there is no ectasia. So let's look at the zonal view of the cornea. The hot zone or the danger zone is actually the front part of the cornea as depicted in the schematic in red. The cold zone or the safe zone is the posterior part of the human cornea where we do DSEC and DMAC. And the warm zone, so to speak, is the mid peripheral cornea where penetrating keratoplasty wound is located. So how do we manage ectasia? Well, you can lower the intraocular pressures with topical medications, rigid gas permeable contact lenses to improve the visual acuity, intracorneal segments, corneal transplantation, either full tissue replacement or selective tissue corneal transplantation, and cross-linking, of course. Since we don't know the cause of ectasia, prevention becomes of paramount interest. And as we are all familiar with the risk score system, where we look at the corneal topography, residual stromal bed, age, and preoperative pachymetry, and of course the refractive error as well, and look at the last column, this is more or less a safer zone, namely where there is non-symmetric bow tie with the topography. Uh, the residual stromal bed, as Barraker had recommended, more than 300 microns, age more than 30 years, corneal thickness more than 510, and refractive error of minus 8 or less. And as we go to the left, the risk factors increase as we look at the uh, topography, the residual stromal bed becoming thinner, age becoming younger patients, and so on. When you add these numbers, you come up with low risk, which is 0 to 2, and you can proceed with the refractive procedures. Moderate risk for uh, a total score of 3, you can proceed with caution. And of course, four or more is high risk um, corneas, and you don't want to do LASIK in these patients. How about thin corneas? Those thin corneas with normal topography. If you look at these various authors and you add up the number of eyes with thin corneas and normal topography, which totals more than 800 eyes, none of these eyes actually developed any ectasia. So a thin cornea is not necessarily a diseased cornea. 38% of North Africans have a central corneal thickness between 450 and 500 microns. African Americans have a, have a central corneal thickness of 52 microns less than that of all races. So a thin cornea less than 500 microns is not an independent risk factor for post-LASIK ectasia. Topography is clearly a major risk factor. Abnormal topography in either eye, be very cautious, and you may not want to do LASIK. This applies both for the anterior corneal surface, and of course we need to look at the posterior corneal surface as well. In those cases where the topography is normal bilaterally, other risk factors need to be looked into as well. 
How about age? This is a series from Bill uh, Tratlers uh, from uh, Florida and notice that in this series N equals 166 eyes, 68 percent of eyes developed ectasia. These patients were more than age 31 years. So in conclusion, ectasia is a known risk factor for LASIK and PRK. Each eye has an individual minimal residual stromal bed that resists ectasia. The elimination of abnormal eyes will decrease the incidence of ectasia, so preoperative screening is very important. Intraoperative pachymetry will further decrease the incidence of ectasia. Currently, there is no way to prevent post-LASIK ectasia. Currently, there is no safe RSB that will prevent ectasia. Most, if not all, studies agree that abnormal topography is the number one risk factor for developing post-LASIK ectasia. There is currently no sure thing when it comes to post-LASIK ectasia risk assessment. So in summary then, in this 10 minutes, we took a journey through various aspects of ectasia. We looked at the types of ectasia, the cause of ectasia, which we poorly understand at this time, looked at the corneal structure, looked at histopathology. We defocused and looked at various uh, corneal procedures and its effects. We looked at the zonal view of the cornea, the anterior part playing an important role in ectasia, how do we manage ectasia, and most importantly, how to prevent corneal ectasia following refractive surgery. Thank you again.